I really wish I could burp on cue because that's exactly how I would have started this episode. Oh, I couldn't do it. Oh, I thought it was there. There she is. Uh, mm, I'm so turned Ooh. on. And this is where we would like to announce um, our interpretation of polyester <laughs> in this episode of Deadweight Survival Guide with smell a vision <laughs> Tell me what I have for lunch. Tell the people at home what I have for lunch. Mm, well, what you were going to tell people is that you had a salad, but actually what you had was beef spare ribs with baked beans and maybe a piece of a brownie. That's actually what I had for dinner last night. I did have a salad Ugh. for lunch today. Thank you very much. And a portobello mushroom <laughs> burger. So how dare you? It's just residual burn. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> it was delicious. Okay. Grateful Garden. It, it was. Up. I mean, it smelled just as, I mean, it smelled great. Like, I know. It makes me now want to have a snack. I like that all of my body odors somehow turn out to be really delicious. Because every time I burp, you're like, is that poopery? Like, that sounds kind of delicious. And then one time I burped, or I threw up at a friend's house because we had been drinking way too much. And then someone's like, how does your vomit smell like blueberries? And I was like, that's what happens when you're pretty. You just, everything you do. Blueberry vodka. Um, blueberry beer. Oh, well, some lightning kugels. Oh, it was hella good. And we went to a beer garden uh, in Denver and it got, it had two for one. And we took that as a challenge as opposed to like a warning. Um, and usually for me, it, it results in bad math. So two for one is actually three mm -hmm. if I'm doing things appropriately, but like three for every trip. And I'm clearly going to have multiple trips because if you've ever gone to a buffet with me, if I do anything less than four trips, I have failed myself. It's not worth the $15.99. No, no. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Hello. Christopher Daniels, you seem educated as I see that you are wearing glasses. <laughs> That's um, thank you. you were, That's why I wore them. Uh, I should have got my glasses. No, you can still see my face. Um, can you let the people at home know how do you define political and or civil unrest? It's a really great question. And it seems like there's a lot of, it's like one of those Venn diagram moments where like every square is a parallelogram, but not every parallelogram is a square. I always say parallelogram, but it's definitely <laughs> parallelogram. It's an um, word, but I feel you. Right, she's wearing glasses, so it's fine. Uh, so a, a political unrest, sort of as I see it, is this summation of um, riots and protests and uh, any activities or events uh, that seek to fight against or speak out uh, against political party, government, faction, um, their actions, what they're doing within a given country. Um, and civil unrest can be anything from two communities, groups uh, within a country battling with one another. It could also be a group of citizens uh, gathering together uh, to protest an unlawful law or action, whether peacefully protesting or not peacefully protesting. So I think within political unrest, civil unrest is contained mm -hmm. um, because political unrest is really the grand summation of all um, all that unrest. And what a, what an interesting time just to bring it up. I mean, I can't imagine that there's anything going on in the world where we would have to talk about this. Like, that's just us, just random people giving you random facts, random trivia, random movies, you know? It's going to be a great time. Yeah, basically, okay, like, insider behind the actor studio TM, we actually just get a dartboard 
and we like threw a dart and it just magically landed on this tacky, ugly orange square that said political unrest. And we were like, that's what we're going to do for no reason whatsoever. And it was really surprising because this square was like this big. And everything oh my gosh, else like, was like this big, so we had to. We had to commit to it. Like, the dart landed on it. We don't have good aim. So the fact that it hit it and stuck was, like, incredible. Mm-hmm. So it was like, all right, I guess, like, on this Tuesday evening, January 19th, the eve before January 20th, we shall discuss get my drink ready some political unrest now you ask me how i define political and civil unrest do you have anything to add contribute change alter delete (laughs) plenty of things actually in our government and our legislation but um given that i don't have that power here on this thing no i think you did a pretty good job of surmising Um, what it is that we will be talking about today. You captured my three films, my three choices for today, really well in that description. So I think you nailed it. Screw what they say. People with glasses, you know what's up. Oh my God, thank you so much. And that is just one of the many tips that you will find right here on the Deadweight Survival Survival Guide. Guide. Oh my God. Uh, uh, Um, uh. So fabulous. This has been so great. I know. Like, really just providing the information that people know to navigate any post-apocalyptic scenario um, in which they might find themselves in. And really, there are a lot, um, fascinatingly enough. And we have been here. We're almost at our year anniversary. Who would have thought we would still be here, stuck at home? With this mm-hmm. fun little project that we created just to pass the time and now has actually provided us a lot of respite and actual tips and tricks that I needed to survive because people try to act out of pocket. And because of the tips that I've learned from you and on this show that we have discovered together, I've been able to do great work. Um, I am so happy about that. I mean, because because not only are we the co-hosts of the Deadweight Survival Guides, but we're also clients as well. I mean, that's just that is just power right there. And also, one thing I just realized: we have not done an episode entitled "How to Survive a Pandemic." <laughs> <laughs> That feels like it hits too close to home. And yep. you know what? I think we're still trying to figure it out. I think that's the reason why. Our first episode after... I don't even know what the f- what that world looks like at that point. After someone says it's over? After we all just walk out of our homes and we're like... Great. Like, there's... What, what is it going to look like? What is the definitive moment? But I guess after we figure that out, the next episode after that, we'll teach you how to survive this thing that we have, for the most part, had to survive. I really feel like it's going to be the opening scene of Hairspray, Good Morning Baltimore. <laughs> um, just all of us, like, waking up and, like, starting this intricate dance number. Uh... Like, good morning, vaccinations, just a prick in my arm. Good morning, vaccinations. Um, I don't know if I want to be John Waters and I want to be the one who's, like, flashing everybody now that I have, like, this freedom to do so. Or if I want to be the girl who's at the club with the rest of the girls and she has her cigarette, she has her martini, and she's got her eight-month pregnant old belly. And she's like, oh, my God, how exciting is it to be out here and celebrating? Glug, 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 glug. I don't care who I am as long as at some point I get to, like, ride on the roof of a bus. Like, that's really all, that's all I want. I want to ride on the roof of a garbage truck. I don't think that's asking for too much. Literally, my senior year, I tried to show up the first day riding in on a garbage truck, and the city of Sparks did not let me do so because of, like, safety concerns or whatever and i was like i go to an inner city school i'm fine also christopher james also fine (laughs) also fine um would you like to start us off today with your first movie recommendation I would. Thank you so much. So my first pick is actually a pick 
that was destined for a previous theme. And I was so sad because it got chopped. And I was very sad and lethargic about it. And as it was swimming in infamy and the pool that is possible selections for our themes, I'm so glad that the opportunity to use it resurfaced. Mm -hmm. Now, in this world of political unrest, there are a few figures in our history that have elicited such vitriolic hatred as this woman. Now, 45, top of the list, for sure. But probably coming in in like a third, maybe a fourth, is none other than Margaret Thatcher. Uh And there is a film, there is a film that speaks to uh, both civil and political unrest centering around the LGBTQ community and a miners association in Wales. Then this is based on a true story. So my first pick for the evening is Pride. Now, oh. oh, 1984, what I love about this film so much is that it really speaks to community organizing and the unlikely partnerships we form when we get outside of sort of the tunnel vision we have about who are allies, who can we work with, what are our mutual goals, and how is it that we can support each other uh, in in our struggles. And so you have this queer organization based in London that decides to support this small mining town uh, and the Miners Association there in Wales. And you see the interaction of this small town that has never met a single queer person in their life. Um, and what forms out of it is lifelong partnerships and a recognition of what solidarity means because who are we actually fighting? Because we certainly should not be fighting ourselves. We need to be fighting Margaret Thatcher. We need to cut that bit down. Yes. And what I love about this film is the moment at the end where so much of it is focused on this queer organization showing up for these minors and helping them attain their rights and in their protests. And then at the end of it, there's a pride parade and the minors show up to it. And it's this heartfelt moment of what is true allyship look like when we're talking about political unrest. And it's about showing up for one another and recognizing the spaces that you're entering into. So the miners showed up, they recognized that they are guests in this space, but also the importance of them standing and walking with this group and with this community. And also when it came time to do contract negotiations, um, the miners association was um, advocating for queer rights within um, their uh, contract negotiations. And again, that reciprocity of like, okay, you came, supported us. Now we're going to come and support you. That's also not just us showing up, but it's also us using our status, privilege, and power to actually affect real change. And not just saying, hey, thanks so much uh, for showing up and helping us. We're now going to ignore you and pretend like you are not there and sacrifice your wants and needs uh, in order to get what we want as the majority population. So it is beautiful, Tarfelt. Andrew Scott is in it. Gorgeous. I mean, just love this film. Christopher Daniels, I'm so glad that you brought this up. And one of my favorite parts about creating magic with you is that we are so in tune, that we are so aligned. This movie was actually like on my top five list of things that I wanted to cover today, but unfortunately it didn't make my top three, but because you were able to bring it on, we can still talk about it. And I'm so excited to do so because this is such a great movie. And like, um, as you have stated, it's the grassroots collective of communities working together to stand up against the thing that's actually oppressing them versus something else that people could be like, well, if they get rights and I want rights too, like, yes, we should all be doing that but not fighting each other for them. We should be fighting them up there to make sure that we get those, all of us, and using your power to actually do so as opposed to just showing up and saying, yeah, I got your back. 
but I don't want to jeopardize anything that I'm doing to help take care of you. I'm looking at you, all the white women who cheer at Suffragette, the film starring Meryl Streep, um, who also played Margaret Thatcher. Crazy. Um, we tied it all back. What a great film. What a great choice. And I sort of love how different these communities are that have to come together to solve it. And the fact that they can, they are able to put aside what their differences are, actually celebrate them, recognize them and say, this is what you bring to the table. This perspective, this experience is what you bring to the table. And we can use that. We can use that for you. We can use that for us. We can use that for all of us. And it's beautiful. It tells you that you don't have to fit into this tiny mold of a perfect caricature in order to make change happen. Change happens because people demand it because people fight for it. And, all your experiences, all your background, all your, uh, what's the word? Inter, inter, your multiple identities. Your intersectional existence. Intersectional or your... experiences is what makes you up. And that's actually what provided you the weapons and the education that you needed to fight this and to stand up for yourself. And I think it's so cool. And this movie celebrates that. And I mean, with the title, like pride, like it's incredible. Mm -hmm. And so much of this is um, if we continue to see uh, the sort of division and divisiveness and assuming that we, that there's no common ground to be found. So you, like you said, there's minors and there's these queer people from London and you think, where's the overlap? Where's the opportunity? Where's the common ground? And you go, well, there's human dignity and there is the ability to work, fair pay, feel safe, protected. And it wasn't just, you know, Margaret Thatcher, you're also fighting against the police brutality that they experience. You're also fighting against sort of this idea that individuals are mechanized workers and they are just simply cogs on a wheel and that they have no identity and they have no purpose other than to continue to fuel and feed the machine, which should be alarming to anyone regardless of your identity. So that recognition of, oh, the more that we continue to unequivocally stand together against this notion that we do not deserve dignity as human beings, that we do not deserve basic rights and basic access to things like food and healthcare and education and all of that, then we're going to continue to be at odds because so much of this is based on scarcity mentality, that there's only so much out there and so you have to fight because if someone else gets more, then you get less. And that is a fallacy of this universe. Mm -hmm. The only thing missing from this movie is Sally Field holding up a sign that says union. <laughs> you know, union <laughs> that was the one thing missing. And honestly, that word in itself, a lot of people are scared of that word. I don't see why. Um, it really just brings it all together. Union. Come together. Come together and stand up for what's right. Don't do it individually. You can't take on these forces alone, but together you can make a force. You can create a force and that's what can help you achieve possible change. And that is so important for everyone, not for any particular reason, to understand. <laughs> <laughs> we need to work together to fight the real problem. <laughs> I love you so much. What is your first choice for the evening? My first choice, Christopher Daniels, is this quiet, tiny little French film from 1967, directed by a small, fairly unknown director, Jean-Luc Godard. And it is called La Chinoise. Uh, Chinois? Chinois. I, you know, I thought I had it. I didn't. Um, and <laughs> this movie is actually super cool because it deals with um, five university students who have decided to spend the summer cooped up in an apartment and they are teaching each other and learning um, Maoist ideology. And it's mm. super exciting because it's part of the new left um, radicals and ideology that was coming into France at that time, seeing how everything was going like with the USSR, everything that's going on with the US of A and how terrible our policies are, the threat of imperialism. And they wanted to fight that against themselves back in France and across the whole world. But my favorite part about this movie is how it tackles ideology and how it tackles 
revolution and people who talk about revolution, but it's all words. So um, these five kids all represent different factions, different versions of what a revolution could look like. Obviously, there's people who are saying that violence is the only way to actually inspire and revolutionize anything. And they have all these Maoist, Marxist, Leninist quotes just around their walls to constantly remind them. These slogans that just like reinforces what they are thinking. And this movie challenges it in a way it's like, okay, are you about that action or are you just saying that? And it actually brings on, um, what's his name? Francis Johnson? Jason? Jensen, uh, who plays himself, and he is a political philosopher and a professor, and he has a conversation with one of the people who believe that violence is the only way towards revolution, because he agrees. He says, I believe in violence to fulfill a purpose. And then he calls these people out. He's like, okay, you, this is your plan. You will enact violence. You will blow up its structures. But then what? And they're like, well, the change will have been made. He's like, how? Apart from causing damage, what did you do? What did you have to say? Were you just yelling to be heard? Or did you have something to say? And I think that's so powerful, especially when there is political unrest. You have to understand that the revolution comes from the work, not from the slogan. There are so many times where slogans are the ones that are like, that's what I remember. Like, that all started because of the slogan. It's because of the work. It's because of the grassroots coordinators. It's because of the activists. It's because of the people who are putting themselves on the front lines to make this change happen, whether it's violent or not. And this movie challenges it in such a good way. And it, and it tells you to back it up. You can do all the reading that you need to. You can print as many posters as you need to. But what is that going to do? What is your plan? And I think that is so invigorating to watch and given the fact that it is Jean-Luc Godard and his filmmaking style is it just breaks every single rule it it there are moments in this movie where there is a second camera who is recording the camera operator recording the scene and he's letting you know I am controlling this image that you are watching and there are so many times where you can actually hear the director asking questions to the actors who are playing these versions of what revolution looks like and he tries to get their input from it. Everything is shot so weird and cool and clinically. And in a way that just kind of makes you question, like, is the media telling you the truth? Or are the people that you are watching just spouting off the same rhetorical nonsense to get it ingrained in your head? So that way you think you have accomplished something when you really have it. And it is so cool, so powerful. Um, it doesn't answer the question, what comes next or and then what? But it really provides a great perspective to get that stuck in your head. And I think this is a great movie for people to watch when they're just like, oh, I'm going to become a radical or I, I know the solution. I know how I'm going to flip this around because I know a lot of those people who give it current events were just like, I got something to say. I got something to do. I'm going to be posting this to let people know that I'm about that action. And I'm like, okay. And then what? What did that do? Where does that come from? What did that lead to? How does that help? Are you just posting this so that people think that you're part of like the revolution or are you backing it up with actual action? And I think it is so fascinating. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. First of all, ugh, fucking have such a hard on for you right now, but also you're welcome. Here's a question for you then. Cause I have many thoughts, but I'd love to hear yours. So when you watch this film, where did you land? So you have these five different like perspective interpretations, manifestations of the idea of revolution, each providing, I'm assuming, different pathways or different tactics, strategies. Stop me if at any point this is inaccurate, but where did you land? Like, did you leave the film and come to a conclusion for yourself around this is the this is what resonated with me and what I connected with? in terms of um, what to do. So upon watching the movie, there was no conclusion that was provided to me or one that hit me. But what I do appreciate that movie is that it did challenge what I thought when I went in. And I think that that was super exciting because that has laid a lot of road for like how much I have grown from there. And so given the, Given the context of what I know outside of this film and through watching this film, I don't always believe that violence is the way to revolution, but I also don't believe that peaceful, res rev 
peaceful protest is going to accomplish everything that we want in the world. I think that sometimes you do have to get your hands dirty. I think that sometimes you do have to fight back with everything that you've got, especially when your life is on the line. So I'm not in a place to judge those people. And we have seen that action actually create proper re reform and dismantling of other structures to assemble structures that actually work. So I'm still trying to figure out what that is but my favorite part about this was that it it challenged the idea that one person holds every answer and even like a collective group because these people say that um, we have to fight for the revolution. We have to fight for our future. And one of the people in the show calls them out and is like, okay, great. That's the future of France. You are talking from a citizen of France. What about a citizen of China who you are looking up to their ideals because it's part of the new um, Chinese cultural movement? But how does you growing up in China or in growing up in France and fighting for that future affect those people? So there is not one solution that's going to solve everything in the entire world. But I think what it allowed me to do was be like, you're right. I don't know. I need to read more. I need to connect with more. I need different perspectives. And understanding that, um, like, I guess this, the best thing you can do is just contri contribute to your community. Con tribute and follow and do the research on how you can help out your community and hope that that expands outward or you can work in tandem with other communities who are saying this is what we're doing and we're finding this to work i think you can't start on a big scale you need to start on a smaller scale and work your way out there which is very frustrating when you need and require big change but i think that one person alone or one group alone can't do that for everybody but groups that are formed around all over and work together and connect. I think that's the solution. That's the solution. Mm. It's interesting you say that because they, you know, and not to, to transition because I want to stay here as long as we want to. There's this note, uh, I listened to this podcast about um, a term called hood feminism. And it's essentially that very idea around small pockets in communities, usually the most at risk, impoverished, um, coming together collectively to really change the economic system, but also the social structures as well. So they're engaging in trading and bargaining systems as a way to fight against the sort of capitalist standard that's put down. Also, this idea of checking in on your neighbors. Also, the idea of the community is the one that comes together when there's natural disaster, when there's uh, a catastrophe, there's a collective um, looking out for one another, um, which is certainly missing and contributes, I think, to it being more difficult to organize because communities organizing as a collective voice um, has such power to it. And mm -hmm. I heard this, and it's not anything new, early on when I started um, doing grassroots movements that the local level is where everything happens. We focus on the national mm -hmm. level or the federal level, but the local level, that is going to impact your day-to-day -day life the most. The people who are in your county commissioner, your city council, those individuals are making ordinances and laws that impact your daily existence. Not that the federal level is unimportant and that there's right. not sort of sweeping national legislation, but if you want to talk about the things that are going to impact your communities where you live, your work, how, you know, infrastructure and transportation and taxes and um, schools and all of that, that's at a local level. Um, and if you can organize effectively at a local level, there is so much impact that you can do with where you live. And it is absolutely fascinating that you brought up those two points in terms of breaking down the capitalist movement. Because at the end of the day, in this movie, these are uh, upper class kids, all white, except for one who has a brief appearance. Um, and they get to spend the entire summer lounging around reading and talking about all these ideals and how they want to revolutionize the world in an apartment that belongs to one of their parents and they have they have the capacity to do that and this movie calls them out on it in such a good way and it even talks about can you can you rebuild an infrastructure from the inside because if you're on the inside you are worried about what's going to collapse on top of you or is it better done from the outside and just dismantling all of it which is where the violence comes in which is really interesting and 
we focus so much on like the big people, the big people who did all of the good work, like the Martin Luther King Juniors, the Malcolm X's, the, the uh, recently the Stacey Abrams, who were like, oh my God, you are our hero for doing all this work. And a lot of people have been like, listen, you know her name and that's really, really good. But what she did was she went out in her community. She she was able to get these group of people. They all did the hard work to make sure that we could flip Georgia, that we could take care of all these things, that we can make sure that people who needed to vote were able to get to the voting locations, that they were there to stand up for them, that they were trying to change those policies in itself. So it's great that we have heroes, but we also need to understand that it starts with our local organizers. So if I'm in Nevada, it is great to recognize someone who's doing great work across the country, which means better things for all of us. But also, do am I familiar with my local organizers here? Am I aware of what's going on in my own city? Am I participating in um, my midterm elections? Do I know who's on any of my councils? Am I aware of that? And I I like to believe that I'm now in a much better place to do so. Um, now I am able to vote and I'm able to vote in a very educated way. I know what the discussions are. I have lived in this area, so I'm just like, who better to have a perspective on what needs to change and what to do better than someone who's living here? And that's what we need to be doing. Like, t- reach out, find your local organizers, reach, find it, find it, and t- work with them and make small change into very, very big change because it all starts on a local level. Mm, I love that so much. And I think will be a recurring theme uh, throughout the entire evening. Um, it leads perfectly as a segue because you know I love a smooth tr- segue to my Mm. second pick of the evening. Now, I struggled with this second choice. Mm -hmm. I actually chose another film originally, and then I changed it, but I'm gonna talk about both. So it's like I chose it, but then chose something different. Are you gonna tell us what it is, or are you gonna keep doing this fun thing where your smooth segue is no longer a smooth segue, and in fact becomes like this preamble? that kind of takes too long and you're like, let's just go to it. I'm just curious. I'm just asking questions. So I'm going to get to what my second choice is, but first I'm going to lean back one more time and then I'm going to lean forward because what I'm doing is creating dramatic tension. You're going to make yourself throw up. So my second choice for the evening that I didn't end up going with was Spike Lee's film, Do the Right Thing. And one of the reasons why I chose this is because even though this was a, well, first of all, Rosie Perez doing uh, an entire choreographed dance sequence at the beginning of the film is just fire. It is just Like, just watch it and you will just be moved and feel better about life. But also the fact this film, I think, came out in 1989 is, I mean, is still so exceptionally relevant um, and powerful today um, when so much of the critic discussion was focused on the destruction of property versus the loss of life and how that was a conversation back in 1989 and how that continues to be the conversation in all of the BLM movements. Now, this film that I chose, and the reason why I chose it is because I watched this film a couple days after George Floyd and watching this film, uh, it's an obviously, it's a powerful film. It's a beautiful film. um, And it has one of my favorite actresses of life, Regina Hall in it. And that's The Hate You Give. And I love this film because I think it talks about political and civil law unrest in a, in a multitude of layers. It speaks to that notion of community organizing and also the compartmentalization um, that BIPOC individuals, I assume, go through when you're navigating uh, being in a Black community. And then as Star goes to, she goes to a pretty much all white school in an affluent community and having to compartmentalize who she is, how she dresses, how she talks, the language that she uses um, in order to fit in is friends with uh, culturally appropriative um, white centered bodied individuals who are obnoxious and see no problem with their actions and also have no connection to her community 
and anything that is going on within the world because they're so narrowly entrenched in their own experience. And part of the harmful and violent aspects of white body centering is that notion that there's nothing that exists beyond the white body, that the only experience, the only perception, the only uh, thing is the white body. And so Star is constantly navigating these two worlds, is in a car with a childhood friend, gets pulled over by the cops. The cops shoot her friend. And now all of a sudden she's at the center of this maelstrom of civil and political unrest with a multitude of wants and needs hitting her from all sides you know, individuals within her community that are wanting her to speak up, but then there's also fear of retaliation and fear of violence and fear of backlash and also um, wanting to get out of this community, but also this is where she grew up and this is where her friends and her family and the community that supported her is. This is where her dad's store is. Um, and, And there's so much memory tied to that. We also see sort of patterns of violence recurring over and over again and how that's generationally passed down and the intergenerational trauma that exists, especially for BIPOC bodies that are passed down from generation to generation to generation, which goes all the way back to its colonial heritage. And that is often what we don't address when we're talking about civil and political unrest is that so often you have people talk about this unrest as if it just set into motion 50 years ago. That this is Mm -hmm. just something that sprang forth out of nowhere, couldn't conceive why, and it just is in sort of a recent timeline when in fact it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. And that violence that seeped into the very soil of America, that violence that seeped into the very cells and structures of our bodies. And so this film, I think is so beautiful. Um, Also has KJ Appa in it, who plays a really non-essential, non-consequential character, but he's very pretty to look at. How dare you on this whole topic? You still had to call out the one regular looking white man. How dare you? That's a part of the problem. Um, (laughs) But Christopher Daniels, I do love this choice. And I'm so excited to follow up with my pick, but obviously we're going to spend some time on this one because it tie in so well together. Um, Do the right thing. Also on my list. They hate you give fantastic film also on the list of movies that we wanted to cover tonight. So I'm glad that we are riding this same wave. How exciting to be able to, and not, and I don't mean exciting in a way that kind of just disregards the actual struggles that uh, BIPOC and specific black people face in the United States of America, that we are able to tell these tales in, in ways that are keep getting updated. Because unfortunately, this is a story that we have been telling for hundreds and hundreds of years. And um, thankfully, now we have actual people of color who are able to tell their own stories as opposed to being like, this is my interpretation of the struggles that you're going through. And Black people and white people should just hold hands and that's, that's, that's how we do it. That's the end of the day. When the, when the issues are significantly stronger. And the main character in this movie has to deal with the fact that... Um, she does take place kind of in two different worlds because she wants better opportunities for herself that she realizes she can't get in world one. So she not infiltrate, that's the wrong word, but she goes to this white school. People really like her there. She has her friends there, but when the subject of police brutality and black injustice goes on, you see how many people start turning on her. And that one little girl that she almost beats up with that hairbrush absolutely deserves it. But um, Mm -hmm. she's like, well, you need to understand that from a cop's perspective, seeing a black man holding a hairbrush, it looks like a weapon. And then the main character has to be like, well, I'm holding a hairbrush now. Does this look like a weapon? Would you shoot me? Do you think I deserve to die for holding a hairbrush? And so she really tries to put it in perspective of like what it means. And the the pressures that we put on black people specifically 
to dress a certain way, to act a certain way, to respond a certain way when authority is challenging them, when it's so dehumanizing and it is so disrespectful to say that and put the issue and the blame on those people as opposed to the people who hold the power, who are able to change all of this and yet refuse to. And it's still, unfortunately, it is the same issue that's been going on over and over and over again because we still haven't been able to challenge it because we still have perspectives that say, well, you have to look at it from the police's perspective. That looked like a weapon. That looked like a black man in a in a bad neighborhood who was holding a weapon, so they had to protect themselves. And I'm just like, you, we are not addressing any of the issues that are important here, and we are unwilling to do that work. And the movie tackles it in such a good fundamental way that shows you this is what you are saying. This is what you are saying when you say these things, and here's how it affects us, and here's why we won't stand for it. So, Christopher, I think this is an excellent choice. And the fact that it's, like, catered towards, like, younger audience is also really, really good because, I mean, Black kids know what's going on. Black kids and BIPOC kids have to grow up at a faster rate than white people do, unfortunately, because of all these things. And, like, how many kids have to learn, like, hands up, don't shoot when a police officer comes by? Or, like, that fear that you have because they've seen it, they've witnessed it. So it's just incredible, incredible. And I'm glad that this movie doesn't talk down to younger people, but, in fact, lets them know this is something that you may face and here's what we can do. Mm -hmm. Well, and something that's so beautiful about what you said um, is especially white people want to say all the time, like unity, we need unity, we need unity, we need unity. And unity is that way of bypassing everything that has happened and ignoring everything that's still happening and expecting BIPOC individuals to meet them where they are at. So all of mm -hmm. this conversation around unity is a way of um, avoiding responsibility and accountability whatsoever and also the avoidance of doing any work whatsoever. Because again, it becomes about BIPOC individuals doing the work to dismantle a system and a structure that they didn't create and that they suffer from daily. Because white people don't want to acknowledge that they created a benefit from it and benefit from it daily and continue to reap. And even when they make that post on Facebook where they're spouting some idea at the same time, refusing to acknowledge the ways that on the daily they make choices that uphold white body centering and continue to uphold white supremacy. So all of those posts does not undo the fact that you are complicit within the system and consciously make choices that uphold that system. And I think it's fascinating with your first choice, the idea of like, where does violence come in, the disruption and the dismantling of these systems? Because these systems are reliant upon our complicitness and reliant upon our resignation to it. It's, it's it's a weird thing, and I had someone explain to me in such a good way, where they're like, white people always want to be over the slavery conversation, which that's not where the issue stems from. Obviously, it's much older than that, but that's a topic that usually goes back to. They're like, white people say, why should I be punished for something that, like, generations of my family did years ago? And someone else said, well, it's because those things that your grandparents did, you still benefit from, and the legislation, the laws, the infrastructure that was created there still permeates today we have to all undo all of that in order to progress forward and when people say oh we need to unionize you need to meet me on my level it's like if someone was riding a train holding up the hand be like oh come on here come on let's let's do this together and you are running to catch up behind this train and you're like reaching out and you're like i'm trying i'm trying to do everything that i possibly can but you need to understand there are power differences that are going on here, the privileges that you have going on here, how much I have to fight for here. Why don't you get off the train and then meet me and then we'll bunch up on it. Or better yet, why not stop the train? Stop the train so we can all catch up, we can all stop heavy breathing, and we don't all have to work this hard, and then we can all travel forward into the future together. We need to all do the work, Mama, not just the people who are trying to catch up. Mm -hmm. It's a interesting conversation when you move past the rhetoric of ideas and and get into the tangibles of how much status and privilege are you willing to give up itemize um, it, is it. it is interesting that you say that because um i have notes and one 
of the one of the slogans that's featured on the wall in La Chin- Chinois. I had it. I say it in my head and I got it. And then I say it out loud and it's not what I want. But it's, um, we must confront vague ideas with clear images. And that for me, like, makes so much sense because we can talk about these things. We can be like, well, in the future, that's what that looks like. And we'll be like, no, what does that look like now? What does that action look like? What do those steps look like? And how do we bring other people with us? And it's, words are just words until we put action into them. And I think... I mean, black people have been fighting this fight forever, y'all. We need to start listening as opposed to being like, but here's how this affects me. And here's how, here's a different perspective that you need to see it from. (laughs) And in fact, um, (laughs) I just, I'm going to roll into my next film because it pairs so nicely with what we're talking about now. We can continue the conversation. But that is a 2016 film called I Am Not Your Negro. I Am Not Your Negro, absolutely fantastic. And I was trying to decide, because I obviously wanted to take on um, race relations Mm -hmm. in this political unrest, because, I mean, we've been fighting the same fight forever. Um, And I say we as in I believe that I am on the bright side. I am standing with Black people who I am trying to dismantle and bring down the systemic oppression. It's not because I am equating my struggle to their struggle. Um, and I was like thinking of all these movies that I possibly could that had to do it. It was Do the Right Thing. It was The Hate You Give. It was Malcolm X, that four hour long movie with Denzel Washington. It was Selma. It was all of du- Ava Duvernay's work. And I was like, I can't figure out what I want to do. And then I settled on I Am Not Your Negro, which for those of you who don't know, um, is based off of James Baldwin's work, his unfinished manuscript for Remember This House. And he had notes that he wanted to put into a book and it was going to be a collective memoir about three close friends that he had, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr. And um, Medgar, oh my God, I had his name, Medgar Evans. I'm so sorry. Sorry, it is important and I will find their name. Medgar Evers. Okay. And, um, he wanted to talk about how they have, were fighting that fight. And those three came from three different ideologies. They had different practices as to how they wanted to tackle this issue, solve this issue, and ultimately bring on a peace and justice for the Black people in the United States of America. And all three of them were assassinated within five years of each other. And none of those three men ever saw their 40s. And they were all doing all this work. And you had Malcolm X, who was about that violence, who was about that action, who says, I will not be a peaceful Negro. I'm going to be up here. I will disrupt everything that you have going on because it makes no sense to me that you should be leaving peacefully while the rest of us are dying, while the rest of us are doing all of this. No, we are going to disrupt everything. We're going to force you to take a look at what's going on. And Martin Luther King Jr., who was saying, let's be peaceful. Let's step into the sunlight together. The only way that we can fight out hate is with love. And uh, Medgar, who was trying to fight all these things in Alabama as well, and the segregation and everything that was going on. So beautiful, so impactful. And it pairs his notes that he wrote in the 1970s about these men to what's going on now. And the fact that it is still the same battles that we are fighting. It is still the same people who are coming up and saying, well, let's take a look at it. Like, are white people to blame? Or do black people have themselves to blame for not being able to progress? Or why is this a race issue? Why, maybe the reason we can't progress is because we are specifically saying that white people this and black people that. Why don't we work together? And he tackles it in such a beautiful way where he's saying, there are things that we can address together. And I would love to do that. When a white man looks at me like I'm his brother, I think we could solve a lot of issues. But the problem is that a white man does not see me as his brother. A white man does not see me as a person. A white a white person sees me as the n-word and that's why he says i am not your negro i am a human being and i have my own experiences and this is what this is and that's what we need to look at that's what we need to challenge that's what we need to face if we want to move forward and it is so stunning it is so sad the fact that we have to keep doing these fights the fact that there has been some resolution but not enough and how we kind of really need to take that on and it is i think it's powerful it is a powerful documentary narrated by Samuel L. Jackson. It is on Prime. Watch it. If you have it, rewatch it if you have, and let's figure it out. Because honestly, why are we still fighting about the same goddamn things when we know the problem and we have a solution for it and Black people have been telling us the solution for it? There has been so many essays and books and speeches and everything done for it. Why can't we do this? And it's because we still refuse to see Black people as equal to everybody else, as the rest of us, as white people. And until that comes down, there's really... It's going to keep being a lot of bloodshed that keeps going down. 
Um, I love this film. This was also on my list. So I'm so thankful because one, I just finished Giovanni's Room, which I also know that <sighs> you, and so I'm, I'm in the post Giovanni's Room feelings. Um, absolutely beautiful. His interviews and his speeches within this documentary are so impactful, so powerful. Um, I'll never forget the moment in this film. And I think it speaks to what you're trying to address as to why, why, why. So James Baldwin talks about that there is a moral monster um, that white people have, that they are refusing to see and refusing to address and refusing to acknowledge. And until white people address the moral monster, they will not be free. And in fact, they will not heal. They will not move forward from this. So the idea that accountability and owning up to, you addressed earlier this idea, why do we have to continue to have the slave conversation? Because at no point have you taken responsibility or been held accountable for it. And until Does... you recognize... I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. I just wanted to add a quick little note that I do have from James Baldwin um, that feeds directly into that. And it stood out to me so much because that's what the giant fear is. That's why white people have such an undoing with this reckoning or like why they can't do it. Um, people cling to their hates so stubbornly because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. And because so much of the black struggle, and I, and I don't want to reduce that into saying that all black people face the same struggle, Obviously, there are different pockets, different communities, different facets of what this includes. Um, but we have seen so much of it. And, like, we saw the L.A. riots. We saw people getting murdered on camera by the police from the police's own camera systems. We are seeing all of it. And there is a genuine fear that we are going to have to deal with all of that as a society, as a culture, as a people, knowing that that has all happened to a specific group of people and once we remove those barriers and once we take that all down, we are all going to have to be forced with that same pain. And a lot of us, a lot of us, I'm saying as a part of the problem and as a part of the society in general, it's not something that you ever want to engage in. So you keep trying to be like those blocks of like, yeah, I'll help you, but, but I'll help you over there. Don't come over here and let me help you, which I mean, that's, you're, that's a divide. That's not a union. That is not coming together to solve this. We have to be able to carry all of this pain together. If we stand together, we can but we have to do it together. And so many people are afraid to. Yes. And I would say like, as an amendment to that is there is pain that white people need to carry and process and own. And that's not the responsibility of any BIPOC individual. So mm. this, but white people continue to run from that pain, continue to think that that pain isn't there. And I think trauma in general, you know, we all are finding distractions to that pain, but white people, especially that goes back to the question of what are you willing to give up? And there's a social ecology class that I'm in right now. And I think you would love it. I think you would get a lot out of it. And the instructor said, we know all the things that we need to do in order to address the ecological crisis and capitalism, social hierarchies. And the question that keeps coming back to is, why aren't we doing these things? And he goes, because you don't want to. That is the reason. If you wanted to do it, it would happen tomorrow. It's not about education. It's not about, but we distract ourselves with this idea that we just need to educate people. We just need to show them it has nothing to do with education. People know they mm -hmm. do not want to. So even I've been in conversations with white people who are like, I'm in this fight. I'm here. I'm in solidarity standing. And you ask them the question, what are you willing to give up status, power, privilege? It's a very different conversation. Because when you start getting into, again, those details of specifics, there's a lot of, mm, like you said, that resistance, that boundary, I'm not willing to give that up. You're like, so you're on stolen lands. Are you willing to give up your house, the land that you're on? And they're like, no, I'm not willing and to do that. And nobody wants to do that. Then don't, 
Don't use the word decolonizing because that is what the word decolonizing means. But you want to use it as a as as a punchline, as a as a buzzword, as something to throw out without any meaning. That is, I think, part of the moral monster that James Baldwin is speaking to: is the atrocities that were committed live within your body. You are capable of doing those atrocities and continue to do them every single day because you are a colonizer living on colonized lands side by side with the people you try to exterminate in that colonization and act like everything is fine, that there is nothing wrong. The amount of moral compartmentalization that white people need to do in order to function on a daily basis, like, is insane. That's the moral monster that white people are refusing to acknowledge is even in the room. <sighs> wow, we we really had a lot to say today, huh? We're only on choice number two. Um, I um, think no. that we there's a lot of things that we could do and say. I think let's wrap up our movie picks, and then maybe we can come to a general consensus at the end again. So Chris, what is your third and final choice for tonight? A complete divergence uh, in, in theme and topic. So I wanted to talk about political civil unrest. One of the things I anticipate in the future we are going to be dealing with, we're dealing with it right now, but I think it's going to become even more, is uh, water rights. Who owns the right to water? And how is water uh, exploited? uh commodified and sold uh to people and so my third choice is tank girl so oh, tank girl yeah <laughs> love this film it's queer it's subversive it it makes very little sense it is choppy it is like low budget i mean i just recently rewatched it and you can see the carabiner cords on the kangaroos as they're like jumping and flying throughout the air and some editor was like i don't give an f about that so here we have a future dystopian where a comet comes, disrupts rain patterns, turns most of the world into desert. So what naturally happens, there's a company that comes along and says, well, let's own all the water of this world uh, and be in control of it. So the, And they make zero um, uh, concessions to conceal their true um, intention because the company's called Water and Power. And, and Ian McDonald uh, is the villain, and I love him. He's the best villain. It's his voice. It's his face. It's his haircut. It's just all the things. And he is trying to control this water. And then you have, um, I think, Lori Petty is her name as Tank Girl. You have Naomi Watts as Jet, um, who are just navigating this desert landscape and they come across uh these individuals called the rippers which are uh genetically modified kangaroo super soldiers ice t plays one of them it's fantastic like it's just a great film and and very subdued from the original comic books but i think still carries through a lot of that queer subversion and the idea of um in the future it won't even be I don't think political unrest, it will be corporate unrest because corporations already now are owning so much and dictating and determining the discourse, the agenda, everything. And so what happens when a corporation owns the majority of water in the world? When someone decides to privatize air and determines that you have to pay to breathe when someone determines that, um, you know, whatever it is, but so much of, we were talking about capitalism earlier and hierarchies is built upon this idea that this thing that is freely growing, freely existing in this world needs to be stored. It needs to be protected. It needs to be concealed from others. It needs to be regimented and doled out. Oh, it, a profit needs to be made off of it. And there are people who have more and people who have less. And there you have 
hierarchies that are birthed from this need to protect this resource that is just free in existence. How are you going to charge something? How are you going to charge for something that is naturally free, that makes up so much of this world? And how are you going to take it from communities and then sell it back to them? Fuck the Nestle company. Uh, I am not going to say that now because fuck the Nestle company for that shit. Um, yeah. also real quick, I heard air rights and I immediately heard like the Kill Bill, like siren themed. Cause I just thought of burlesque and how stupid that movie was and how it's like only solved because of air rights, which also pissed me off. Cause like you can't buy air. You can't buy air. You don't deserve the right to buy air. You can't say no one else can do anything in this patch of air because I own this air. Um, and water rights. Are you kidding? Probably the most fundamental thing that humans need. And for the majority of the world, um, all living creatures need in order to sustain life, in order to give back, in order to keep producing. The plants need it. The animals need it. The people need it. Are you f kidding me? Oh my god. Um, Christopher Daniels, I was so excited because you were building this movie up because you were like, some of them! Some of them we're gonna get a little loosey goosey with, but what a perfect movie to bring up, and what something that is so real and going on right now in the world. And a remake is in talks with Margot Robbie as um, Tank Girl. I know, I know. How so excited! Is that so be? excited! Oh my gosh, it's gonna be amazing. Well, and the idea, you know, because the villain has created this contraption where basically they can stick this water bottle apparatus on you, and it sucks the water out of you. And I just think, oh my, like this, this will happen. Like this is going to happen. Isn't that also the plot for the tuxedo with Jackie Chan and Jennifer Love Hewitt? Isn't that be, also? I've never seen it. I can't wait. <laughs> we need to watch it together. I love the tuxedo. Okay. Um, but it does involve also a lot of water regulation and corporations try to privatize water so that they can sell back to you and they create water that dehydrates you so that you need to buy more water which is wild to me but i don't see it above it happening also this movie is also just um mad max fury road practically the same story that one person controls the water and they control all of society no one should be in control of water it is water um and this actually brings me back to a lot of um issues that native americans are having in regards to protecting their land to protecting their resources to protecting their supplies from american and american corporations who want to put all these giant oil pipelines right through their land that's going to disrupt everything around them and how often people have had to fight to prevent that from happening and how many times we have to keep doing it because people keep saying yeah i know that you know what's going on here but i'm trying to make money so we're going to invest everything that we have, which is a lot of money, and we're going to use it against private citizens because we have more money than them and people who are at a disadvantage, people, minorities who are in groups that don't get proper funding, that don't get taken care of, and how fucking bullshit it is and just how garbage it is that we have to keep putting up with it. They're natural resources. Natural resources. <laughs> What a great choice. I'm furious. <laughs> That's actually the new tagline for Deadweight Survival Guide. What a great choice. I'm furious. God. God. Um, I want to follow this up with my third film, which is, um, coincidentally, a survival god on its own. And that is 2016's How to Survive the Plague. No, 2014. Oh my god, did I get a year wrong? How embarrassing. Um, 2012. 2012's How to Survive the Plague. <laughs> 2016 was I'm Not Unique. I had my dates mixed up. I was going to do them in chronological order, but then we flipped the script on the order that I had in my head. Um, this movie is really fucking fascinating because where we have been talking about um, ideology and about supporting the action and about ongoing fights, this movie does a really great job of chronicling um, the work of activists and the activist group ACT UP and TAG in order to fight the AIDS epide pandemic. Epidemic? Pandemic. I think it's classified as a pandemic, even though it should be epidemic, but I think 
the World Health Organization classifies it as a pandemic. Um, and you have this journalist, David Frank, David, David France, who um, he was a journalist who, like, from the beginning of the epidemic was covering everything that was going on. He was talking about the numbers. He was talking about potential medicines that could do, where this is all coming from, how the United States government is not responding to this at all because Ronald Reagan is a fucking piece of shit. Um, and I hope that we all at some point get a chance to pee on his grave. And he was doing that and he collected over 700 hours of archival footage of protests of speeches of demonstrations of conferences of news footage of interviews with leaders in this um i want to say gay but i want to say lgbtq plus spectrum because it did expand into more because the united states government considered aids a gay plague not a lot was doing on it they're like well we're homophobic and if the gays are dying out that's better for us until it became a problem for straight people for suburban people um and then we were able to do this but it makes me so excited knowing that the lgbt community community a community that i am so proud to be a part of and like identify with so well showed us that with proper organization with proper community leaders with protests and demonstrations and disruptions of society in general we can create that action how they did create all these different organizations and programs to help speed up the trials for um, medicine that could help you once you were diagnosed with hiv or aids or how um they made legislation that absolutely changed everything as to how we were responding to it how they made doctors legally required to help take care of aids patients because for the longest time they're like we don't know what this is and we don't want it. So we're just going to let you die because, oh, and how they actually like protested uh, immigration law because the United States was not, was not allowing any tourists or people immigrating to this country upon entering if they had been diagnosed or had been confirmed to be HIV positive. And that law actually extended into medicine. So if you're traveling with ACT or ZDT, they would not let you into the country one they didn't want you giving medicine to other people two they also didn't want more hiv people related here and it just does a great job of showing you real world action that resulted in real world results and it is so exciting and cool to see obviously um it's still not something that is cured but it became something that was a death sentence and made it manageable and their actions did that and they did that for their own community because no one else would do that for them and that is so exciting to see so i'm glad that we were able to end it on here with the actual showing that the, the the work leads to something and can do something bigger i love it i love it and i need more people to see it because people do not understand enough that this was so scary i obviously wasn't a part of it so i don't want to speak on behalf of that i don't want to pretend that i'm a bigger player in this than i actually am but i have done the research i have looked at all these things i have watched several films several interview studies all of these things that related to this and how scary and dangerous it was and how they were saying well maybe you should just stop having sex which is not a solution that we have given anywhere else in history. And in fact, we were just like, well, you know what? What if we can take care of this? What if we make this safer? And now there is PrEP. And you should always use PrEP with condoms because PrEP does not prevent against STIs. Um, it does help prevent HIV. But we need to use all of it together. Let's work smarter. Let's work harder um, so that we can pump harder. And it is so exciting. Ooh. That's it. Um, I absolutely love this choice um also not something that i have lived through but i do have two gay uncles who lived through this and we were watching um a normal heart when they did i love the play and then they turned it into um mini series television event film mm -hmm. and there's a scene where one of the characters takes his Rolodex and he throws it into the trash because everyone on the Rolodex has died. And my uncle just started crying and he was talking about how, again, we're talking about trauma. We're talking about generational trauma. He talks about you're losing multiple people a week. Someone you would see on a Tuesday, you're going to their funeral on a Saturday. And I couldn't wrap my mind around that. Because, you know, death, especially in this country, is still something that is not really talked about. It's not really processed. It's not really handled in a very healthy way. What would that mean 
when the majority of people in your life are gone rapidly. I, I like I couldn't imagine that sort of that fear and that trauma and the anxiety, not knowing where it was coming from, talking about how it was a gay cancer and was specifically targeting you know, queer people and that stigma that was attached to it, the stigma of not having access to services, but also basic human dignity, sort of bringing it back to our early conversation around how easy it is to dehumanize people and therefore deny them proper care, proper services, life-saving treatment. We had a president and it's, it's, heartbreakingly beautiful that you chose this because one of the biggest things from President Reagan is that refused to say HIV or AIDS at all, refused to acknowledge that it was happening. And we have just lived through a year. We just passed 400,000 deaths here in the United States from a president who refused to acknowledge that it was a thing, refused to acknowledge that this was a problem there and that there were steps that could have been taken just like in the HIV AIDS pandemic epidemic crisis. There were things that could have been done, but conservative legislation, conservative mindsets, haltered progress, denied life-saving uh, services to individual and created a culture of fear and hatred among those who were not only uh, diagnosed with HIV or AIDS, but also from communities impacted by it the most. Mm -hmm. And I, that is my one complaint about this movie. There was another AIDS um, researcher and historian who did say that this movie focuses so much on like uh, the white saviors of this whole thing, focuses a lot on those people, which is great. They obviously did contribute to the solution of this, but it didn't talk about how the fact that HIV and the AIDS affected um, uh, the Latino and the black communities significantly worse. Um, I believe that black people make up 52 or 53 percent of the population currently of people who have died from aids in the united states of america and we're up to over 700 thousand deaths from aids in the united states since um this whole thing started which is crazy because we knocked that out in a year <laughs> we did that in a year um mm -hmm. but it is just absolutely wild and how it targeted gay and bisexual men that's how it started spreading people who use drugs as opposed to being like well you need to stop these bad actions and that won't happen to you like no people are not going to stop living people are not going to stop doing what they need to do what we need to do is we need to make it manageable we need to make those resources more accessible we need to take care of these people we need to talk about the fact that why a lot of black and latino communities use all of these drugs to begin with what's going on there Let's talk about the economy. Let's talk about proper city planning. Let's talk about all these things. So I would like to see a follow-up that does that more, but I still believe that this is super important to see how that just affected everybody for the most part. And it is, it is so scary. It is so scary. The lack of information, the lack of knowledge. Um, growing up, I discovered that I had friends who were um, HIV positive and it made me so scared. And I was like, I can't be around them or unfortunately I'm going to get this. And like, as much as I love them, I have to protect myself. And I would look back and I was like, I was so ignorant. I was so ignorant, not for any fault of my own. This has just been the information that's been provided to me in the public school system of the United States of America. And that this is the most scary, scary thing. And now there is ways to treat it. Now there is ways to slow down the deterioration process of it. You can live a full, healthy life with HIV. HIV is no longer a death sentence. And I think that that is so incredible. And it was done because of the work of these people. And I love seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, and like all things, if you have access to those medications. So everything mm -hmm. is interrelated. And I love how you brought that up. The sort of, um, you can't really examine anything in isolation mm -mm. because the interrelated i mean we could spend an entire like how do you survive the healthcare system in the united states because i'm trying to figure that one out <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I signed up for health insurance and it made me and i, I was super stressed about the whole thing i made someone hold my hand because it's it's just it's nerve-wracking and i can tell you i have insurance right now i cannot tell you what it covers i don't believe it covers anything 
Um, I believe that basically if anything happens to me, um, I will be in millions of dollars of debt. So basically it's like, if anything happens to me, it better take me out because, uh, (laughs) you, you can try coming for that money, but you will not find it. Um, one time I broke my foot and instead of going to the hospital, I was like, that's going to be expensive nuggets. I took care of it at home. And now I still walk and tweak a little bit and it is an astounding thing. And I have health insurance now, which is crazy um, and exciting. But the amount that I'm still paying for medications that I receive every 30 days uh, for the amount of times that I have to get blood work done to make sure that the, my medicine is taking care of me, um, the times that I have to go visit my doctor and I have to do consultation, I'm like, wow, this is pretty Pisces. And I think that I have all right insurance. I can't imagine. I mean, I could because I I have done it before and I neglected to take care of myself because of that. But just racking up all these hospital bills and you're just like, well, I'm going to die. I'm going to die because I can't afford medication because they won't treat me. Because will I live and then be in debt forever? And then is that a life worth living? Do I have to keep staying on all these things? What does that even look like? So it is definitely wild. Definitely wild. Healthcare is a scam, uh, and your health insurance should not be tied in with your place of employment. That's ridiculous. Boom. Now, what a phenomenal... I mean, this journey (laughs) of this evening, how amazing. I mean, is is there anything that we, in terms of tips and tricks of how to survive political unrest that we did not cover, uh throughout the episode i think there's a lot of things that we did not cover one because we don't have the space two because maybe we're not the most qualified people to speak on behalf of that and i'm a person who is trying to do the work to not just shout out information that i kind of remember and then that leads to false information so what i can do is mama let's research let us research and that just doesn't mean like a specific topic that means looking at people that means looking at previous movements that involves looking at other ways that the society has been disrupted and what came from that that Im- that involves looking up who your local city council is who is representing you do they actually represent you find out what they stand for do some research for yourself what do you stand for how do you want to see the world what does that look like and then get with people who have this information and don't just follow it blindly because um ideology that you believe in but can't support or can't back up or don't question is very foolish and probably just as dangerous so we need to be doing all of that and make sure that wherever you are coming from if you take a stance be prepared to back it up not in a way that like you should always be ready for like a fight or like someone's going to challenge you but you should be able to because it matters because those are the details that matters and those are the details that result in change i mean absolutely how powerful um And I think one of the greatest things that we can do in that research is come from a humble position of not knowing and Mm. recognizing that, especially for white people, there is a tendency towards that saviorism about coming in to these movements, to these causes and assuming control as if you can fix it, that you know what's going on. When in actuality, so much of that energy is directed inward about your own complicitness and your own mistakes and the own things that you've done in the past. So first and foremost, how to survive political unrest is understanding the origins of it within you. So understanding the past is exceptionally important and understanding that that trauma lives within you, especially if you're in a white body, that energy of a colonizer, that energy of oppression and dominance and um is within you and how you continue in your daily decisions choose to uphold these systems and so that healing work does begin with you but it certainly doesn't stop there because if you stay within yourself um you isolate yourself and you close yourself off to recognizing that you cannot remove yourself from the system in which you participate in. So doing that healing work, so you're not projecting, especially on BIPOC individuals, you are not 
assuming that they are going to do the work for you. You are not asking them to show up in any way for you, but you are continuing to make mistakes, to learn, to humble yourself to the work and continuing to show up time and time again. And being willing to be held accountable, being willing to admit that you're wrong, being willing to be silent, to give up that status and to give up that power and to fully understand what that means when we're talking about revolution. Because again, that rhetoric, if you don't fully understand what it means and you don't fully have a concept of what comes after, then it's just words. Because if you truly understood, there's that little space for you to go, I actually don't want this. I just wanted the attention and recognition of talking about wanting it without actually understanding what follow through would mean for my daily existence and daily life. And then uh, forming those communities, forming those economic blocks. So one of the biggest things I think how to survive political unrest is understanding where your money is going and how you are spending it and how where your dollar bills are going also is upholding that system. So it's not just about, you know, your beliefs and your values and the things that you're saying, but what are the actual actions that you're taking specifically around businesses that you're supporting, products that you are purchasing? How is that contributing to the economic monster that perpetuates the patriarchy, that perpetuates systemic racism, that perpetuates hierarchies, control, and dominance? Look at us go. Um, I think I have two more things, quick little things to add to that before we wrap up and call it a day on political unrest because it has been very taxing. Um, not that the work is ever done. We have to keep fighting. But we need to also stop being afraid of getting in trouble. Um, there are so many people who I know who are like, oh, I would do that or I would involve myself or I would engage, but I don't want to get in trouble or I don't want to be harmed or I don't. I don't want to be part of disrupting the system, but I want to be part of the change. Girl, it is a revolution, whether you're talking about <laughs> what kind of power or person or government or group that's in power is ever going to be like, oh, you know, they want something. Let's just give it to them. No, honey, it is called a fight for a reason. You are going to get in trouble. You are going to break the rules. You are going to break the law. Why? Because the laws are in place to uphold this structure that doesn't work. You cannot be pro-revolution and wanting to fight against getting in trouble. Because that's literally the whole point. We have to dismantle that whole thing. Which leads to my second point. You should always be prepared. Um either with a crowbar or some hammer and you better have a nice pair of boots because we are going to be doing so much work. We are going to be dismantling so many systems. We're going to be ripping floorboards out of buildings that are not made for us. And we are going to rebuild new. And if people stop, stay in the way, you're going to need that crowbar, honey, because we're going to fight and you're going to need those boots, those Q talk Martins that you got on sale two for one special. Oh, and we're going to fucking oh stomp gosh, on yes. some Nazis because people want to be in the way. Be prepared to dismantle and be prepared to fight. I love it. Um, my last thing I will add, which uh, fits perfectly within that, is also be ready to create. Oof. Be ready to dismantle, be ready to fight, and be ready to create. And that creation manifest as a multitude of things, but also recognize that as that dismantling, you are not recreating the same thing. You are creating something different, not necessarily new. It's not about necessarily like invention, but it's about creating something different. And in that creation, recognize who is there and who is not there and how you are creating it and why you are creating it. Perfectly said. Perfectly said, Christopher Daniels. <laughs> um, I'm so excited that we got to do this together. I think because we have so many choices, this might be something that we have to, uh, that we randomly uh, decide to tackle again later. 
Um, but it was so exciting to tackle it on with you tonight. I love seeing your perspective. I love seeing your choices. I love how far we go with the show. Um, and I'm so excited for the revolution. And I'm so excited knowing that I have really great people in my life who are part of that revolution, who are doing that work, who are maybe afraid, but not too afraid that they refuse to do anything and remain seated. Like we are all doing that work. And I'm so excited and I feel inspired by those people. And it shows me just how much fucking more work I have to do to catch up with them. And I'm so excited to do that work. And I love getting to do that work with you, Christopher Daniel. So thank you. Um, thank you. I think this is um, one of my favorite episodes um, because again, I think art will continue and has continued to be one of my favorite media to talk about uh, civil and political unrest because I think it's ripe with such ability to communicate messages uh, of a variety of meaning the power to move people and transform people and to ignite and to, you know, excite to do that work. And so I certainly feel fuller from this evening. Um, and I just love and appreciate your voice and your perspective so much because I gain so much simply by being in its presence. So, um, much <laughs> you're so welcome i love you so much i love you so much um not for any other reason and not because i'm trying to speak anything into existence at this current moment in time but what do you say we provide a smooth transition into the next topic and tell the people at home what they can expect to hear from us next week I am so thankful that you chose me um, for a smooth transition because I, <laughs> from my second choice, that was definitely not something that I nailed. God love you. Um, so we are going to do for next week's episode, how to survive childhood. <gasps> Because some of y'all bitches ain't know. Ooh. Some of you are grown Ooh. ass, tall ass, Ooh, tall. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. Oh my gosh. I. I mean, adults throwing tantrums. It happens more than it ever should in a lifetime. And I'm fucking tired of it. Um, <laughs> so I'm so excited to do that next week with you hopefully we all have a next week and for some reason we haven't lost all access to power water resources land air um human rights uh it's gonna be very very exciting i'm excited to do that with you and if you need me tomorrow at all during the day don't i am out i will be taking a vacation day internally Ooh. exteriorly metaphysically metaphorically predominantly i'm just gonna be out and i can't wait to see you next week and see what happens um i love that so much i will be holding babies um and grounding mm. in the magic of babies and shielding them to the best of my ability from anything that may arise tomorrow what could that be? Who knows? How how fun? I don't how... know. It's, right. it's, it's, it's just a Wednesday. <laughs> Thank you, Derek Nance, for being our technical producer and keeping this shit together. You are the bee's knees, and you are the goat's tea, and I absolutely adore you. And Christopher Daniels, I also adore you. Um, I have some shrimp to go warm up, so I need this to be over now. <laughs> I also...